And here we go. Hey, good evening, everyone. Nice to see everybody coming in tonight. Uh, Johnny, how's it going? I'm just making sure we're good over here on Facebook, but um, Martin, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm good. Can you hear me now? Gotcha. Yeah. All right. I'm I'm good. Uh, thanks, Gabe. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How have you been? How's uh, Happy New Year? Yeah. Uh, well, it's cold. It's winter. It's dark. It's not my favorite time of the year, but still right. flying. There you go. Yeah, that's great. Good deal. Well, thanks for joining tonight. Let's see, we've got uh, some more. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Hey, I'm doing great. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year to you, too. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. This is awesome. Have you been flying lately? Um, I flew up to New York for like a Hudson River excursion with my flight school. We did like a big fly out after Christmas. So that was amazing. That's cool. That's, yeah, nice. such a cool experience. That was with uh, Av Aviation Adventures, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <clears throat> It's I interesting. We had over 30 airplanes. I noticed. Yeah, you guys had quite the um, quite the crew because I looked on Four Flight. There was a picture that people had. There was like a trail just <laughs> yeah. going through there. It was great. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Coolest turnaround a point ever for the um, Statue of Liberty. <laughs> right. We live in the Philly approach lady as we were all exiting New York. She got kind of annoyed with all the Sky Ventures call signs. <laughs> just like, who are you all? Like, <laughs> stop talking over each, you know, over the top of each other. So I, funny. <laughs> I'm jealous that you can just go there for a day trip. You know, for me, that takes a day just flying to the area and then another day coming back. Yeah, right. 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 Where are you, Martin? I live in Iowa. Okay. Nice. Has it been good flying out there? Recently? Easy flying, but you know it takes a long time to get anywhere scenic from here. Yeah. The good news is any IFR clearance is you know clear direct. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah. Well, you know when I flew out there to Indiana a few months, like I guess it's been two months ago, maybe now, flying just so flat and it's all grids and everything. I was. It, it's just. Totally different <laughs> than uh, not that the mountains are over here. It's just it's just flat out there. Um, it's where I'm from, but it's kind of crazy flying over it for the first time. Yeah, um, the grid is remarkable, right? If you want to count miles, you just count the roads because it's like yep. there's a road every mile in east, west, north, south, and yeah, easy to estimate distances. That's right. That's right. Um, well, hey, thanks for, for joining us, guys, and um, we'll probably start here about 10 after and go from there, but uh, I'm excited for tonight because uh, Tim, Tracy, and Mike all came together and uh, have volunteered their time to share their knowledge with us, so on these different topics, and i um, excited for it, and, and Tracy uh, is joining us all the way from uh, Portland today, so uh, Portland, Oregon, so uh, put together some content so really looking forward to this and um we are going to record it as always on facebook live too and i noticed there are some people in, the, in there so if you want to have questions or anything probably come over to zoom if you want or put them in the chat we can answer them there too so but um yeah it's good to see everybody celeste i saw you on the call last night on uh, the uh the the fast team call you're on mute That, thanks, Gabe. Yeah, that was excellent. That was a great presentation. I've always been I've been trying to, to get to that one and just have never had a chance. So that was a good review and a lot of new information too. So good. There's going to be, um, I'll be uh, probably getting that slide deck again updated because every single time that uh, John Somiak has given that, he's provided the content. We put it on the website. So we'll probably get that up there in the next few days if you want that slide deck. 
Okay, so, uh, fantastic. It'll be the most updated information. Uh, but yeah, he always does a great job, and that was a great turnout. There was there was a good there was a good crowd there. There's a lot. Yeah, there were a lot of people. Yeah. So. Um, Sorry, I missed it. I plum forgot about it last night. <laughs> I almost did too. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I absolutely forgot about it. You yeah, your, you have to set your alarm. <laughs> <laughs> your phone. <laughs> well, I don't feel too bad because I've been to the last three ver three issues editions of it, so I I'm up to date on my SFRA operations. But <laughs> I'd still like to to show up just to at least uh, run the count up a little bit. Yeah, that yeah that was a good one, um, and it was right at an hour, so it wasn't you know too long or anything like that. So it was good. The one thing that they don't do, you know, they don't record it, so we can't put it anywhere. So um, that's all on the FAA's um, Zoom account. So, um, but anyways, um, all right, cool. Well, let's see. I think we can probably go ahead and get her started. What we're going to do is, I think uh, what we agreed about 20, 25 minutes of uh, content of presentation, and then maybe um, depending on, I mean, we don't have such a huge group in here tonight. Maybe we could do questions throughout, or do you guys want to wait until the end? Um, Tim, Mike, and Tracy, do you have thoughts on that? Do you want to wait until each section, or do you have a preference? It doesn't matter to me. I mean, we can do questions. Uh, definitely questions within the section probably works out better. So people like me don't forget the question seven minutes in and have to wait an hour to answer the question. But, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine with people just shouting the questions out or, or whatever and, uh, while I'm talking. OK. Works for me too. Okay. I'm indifferent. I'm indifferent. I'm working with one screen, so it may be challenging to see if somebody has a question, but I'll do my best. Okay. Well, great. Well, um, like I said, thanks for everybody for joining, and thank you, uh, Tim, Mike, and Tracy, for putting um, this content together to share with everybody. Um, I know that I'm sure all of us are maybe getting a little bit Zoom fatigued, so I appreciate being here, and um, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, what we're going to do, like I said, 20, 25 minutes of, uh, of presentation, and then we'll go from there. But uh, I, I do want to introduce, uh, I want to introduce everyone. And I really, we actually didn't ever even uh, say who was going to go first. I don't really have a preference. So <laughs> um, whatever you all want to do. But uh, I'm not going to give a big long introduction because uh, I, I'd like to have you all give your background a little bit. I don't want to cut you short. Uh, but like I said, we do have Tracy uh, White uh, joining us from Portland, Oregon. He found us um, on one of the other uh, calls that we had, and uh, he is going to be talking about ADM and flight standards. Um, and Tracy will give you a little bit more about his background, which is very impressive. And we have uh, Mike Schwartz, who is an FAA inspector, um, also a CFI and ATP over at uh, Aviation Adventures, um, and always doing a great job keeping us up to date on uh, on just all the information that's coming out and, and being uh, super uh, gracious with his uh, ability to share your knowledge. So thanks for joining us, Mike. Um, and we also have Tim Fisher, uh, not uh, at least uh, the, 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 the El Jefe of, of uh, aviation. Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, he is um, a longtime friend and also the uh, uh, founder of Aero Elite Flight Training. Um, I've known Tim for Boy, probably, well, definitely too long for sure. Um, Tim and I actually did a lot of flying back in 2015, 16, probably 17-ish, but um, founding member of Smokehouse Pilots, and I'm glad that you're here to uh, also give a, a, a presentation tonight too. And we actually have you coming up next week as well, uh, as far as flying a Turbo Seneca, uh, yeah, Turbo Seneca, um, and uh, looking forward to that. So thanks for joining us, Tim. Um, and always all, you know, keeping us safe and, and updated and educated along the way. You guys are doing a great job at Aero Elite, so keep it up. Um, Thank you. With that said, I am done talking because uh, that's not the reason we're here. Um, whoever wants to go first, we should have talked about that beforehand, but uh, I am open to whatever you all want to do. Um, perhaps, Mike, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I've, I've got uh, a nice long presentation. I'll whop in 20 to 25 minutes to go through, so your 25 minutes of presentations I've kind of eaten up already, but I figured that's what we were given each. So that's what I took. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I'd like to talk tonight about um, a, a little bit about myself, I guess is a good way to start to give you an idea of my background. I started in aviation 
42 years ago in the United States Air Force and I started in aircraft maintenance, spent three years working operationally over in Europe on F-111s and then found myself uh, in the desert at uh, Edwards Air Force Base involved in um, aircraft flight test, uh, maintenance, engineering and, and support and spent the bulk of my time in F-16 flight test out there. And, and that's where I started flying as well. Got my A&P out there, started flying out there and, and uh, got out at, after 12 years, went back to Tennessee, went to Middle Tennessee State University, uh, Blue Raiders. We'll let you talk about your Eagles later, Tim. Um, and, and got my bachelor's in aerospace maintenance management and got a master's in aviation safety. I've worked for aircraft manufacturers. I've been flight instructing since 92. So what's that, uh, 28, 29 years now. And, and I, I fly regularly every weekend. I, I uh, support um, maintenance operations where I'm able. And, and I'm currently employed by the, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration as an aviation safety inspector, like Gabe said. My specialty is general aviation operations, but I'm currently working in the safety management systems program office. And one of the areas I specialize in is the area of risk management. And that's what I wanted to talk to you all about this evening is, is, is a, a very good model um, when it comes to, uh, the theme tonight was risk management. So I, I, I figured that'd be appropriate. And the model I'd like to talk about this evening is actually threat and error management. Those of you that know me really good know that I'm allergic to acronyms. I rarely like to use them or speak them. And other than one or two that may slip out tonight, you, pro you shouldn't hear any. Um, I work for the government and I absolutely despise acronyms because they don't help. And the model I want to introduce you to is the threat and error management model. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my, my uh, camera off and I'm going to turn on some screen sharing so y'all can see this. There, I think you got that. Can you see it, Tim? Got it. Excellent. Yes, I can. Um, like I said, this is a practical model for you to integrate into your aviation activities, and it is entitled Threat and Error Management. A little bit about, about the model. In 2016, the FAA started moving away from the practical test standards as testing documents for airman certification. The practical test standards had a listing in the front of them of about 15 items that were expected to be incorporated into each task that had to be accomplished. These are known as special emphasis areas. They include such things as checklist usage, runway incursions, and risk management. The new document um, that many of you are aware of now is called the Airman Certification Standard, and it includes all of these special emphasis areas within the tasks that are being evaluated. The FAA has included new knowledge testing information with updated knowledge testing codes that provide greater focus on key knowledge elements. And they've integrated everything to make it easier to review the areas where a student has been found deficient on a knowledge test. And they've defined the standards very clearly. One of the key things they did in the Airman Certification Standards is they added a new section specifically on risk management. Threat and error management is specifically called out for in the um, airline transport pilot airman certification standard as a voluntary safety program. It's interesting to note that threat and error management doesn't appear in the FAA's risk management handbook but I can assure you that I'm working very diligently to get that changed um, as it is something that is uh, potentially testable on knowledge exams. And I really am on a, on a working group right now working on the risk management handbook. I felt it was so deficient, they had to let me on the, on the uh, work, work group. 
Threat and error management is not a revolutionary concept, but one that has actually evolved gradually. It started as a consequence of the constant drive to improve the margins of safety and aviation operations through practical integration of human factors knowledge. Threat and error management was developed as a product of collective aviation industry experience. Such experience fostered the recognition that past studies and most importantly, operational consideration of human performance in aviation had largely overlooked the most important factor influencing human performance in dynamic work environments. And that's the interaction between people and the operational context. And what I mean by that is the organizational, the regulatory and the environment factors that they're um, working with and where they have to discharge their operational duties. Now, I know some of you that are, are watching are instructors or have been working on your CFI and are learning a lot of things from the Aviation Instructor's Handbook. And you're probably very familiar with the law of primacy. The law of primacy is key in aviation education since the threat and error management model is referred to specifically in the Airline Transport Pilot Airman Certification Standard. It just makes sense for us to start using it for our students along with the PAVE, the I'm safe and the decide models uh, that they learn at the private pilot level. And if that's not a good enough reason, several major airlines are using this model as well with their flight crews to brief and debrief flights. So if it's good enough for the majors, it should be good enough in general aviation. The key to any risk management model is its ease of use and the ability to improve safety. Normal operations should be safe operations in any endeavor. That's where the green box on the screen is depicting. This is where we want to operate. Now, I know you, some of you may have seen the safety models of the iceberg and were told that the bit above water is actually what causes accidents. And the rest of the iceberg underwater is all of the things that lead up to the accident. What I'm gonna do with this model is we're gonna actually flip it over and draw our triangle with the point down. As the name implies, the first thing we want to consider are the threats that affect our flight. This is accomplished during pre-flight planning when briefing the flight or lesson. By discussing potential threats, we can better prepare for them and mentally get in the zone. Let's look deeper at what threats are. Threats are any condition that could increase the complexity of an operation. I mentioned I have a master's degree in safety, so sometimes I do tend to use some of the more collegiate or industry specific definitions. So if I get too deep, let me know and I'll back up and, and I'll go more plain language for you. These are, th so, so threats are anything that can decrease the safety margins and if not controlled, they could lead to errors or uh, decreased safety margins from that as well or unwanted aircraft states. Threats are red flags and they should warn the pilot that something bad could happen. The potential is there. Some examples of threats that we should consider during pre-flight are birds or animals in the operational area, low ceilings, a lot of aircraft in the practice area, antennas and the guide wires that support them. Fatigue is a threat to our safe operations as is a lack of recent experience. There are two types of threats that we need to consider, external threats and internal threats. External threats are those conditions outside of your control, weather, animals, other aircraft. Internal threats are those conditions we can't control if we recognize them as threats. They could include things such as not getting enough sleep, worrying about a personal issue, loss of situational awareness while operating the aircraft. For conditions to be an aviation hazard, 
there must be some type of exposure to the aviation operation. As an example, not all power lines or telephone wires are hazards. However, the wires in the photo are a hazard because they're in a place where aviation operations come close enough for airplanes to become tangled up in them. There are two aspects to threat management. First, you have to recognize that the threat exists. If you're not aware that a threat, a threat exists, you cannot manage it. Be on the lookout for threats. Some threats like windy, rainy weather or broken equipment should be easy to recognize and deal with. Other threats like complacency, task interruption, or a poorly written checklist are not always easy to recognize. With practice, you will learn to recognize these harder to recognize threats. Second, when you're aware that a threat exists, then you can develop a strategy to deal with the threat so it does not reduce safety margins. So do you think a Ferris wheel at a county fair is a threat to aircraft? Guarantee you, these guys will tell you that it is a threat. They didn't see it coming. The second step in our model is um, errors. See how easy this model is? We have threat and error management. We started with threats, now we've got to errors. You might be thinking, what is an error? An error is the mistake made when threats are mismanaged. It is possible for errors to occur without an observed threat. Error management refers to the process of repairing an error before it becomes consequential to safety. Now there are five types of errors, but I'm just gonna focus on two procedural errors, uh, which are procedural errors and proficiency errors. Procedural errors are listed in the airplane flying handbook for the maneuvers we practice and are expected to perform. Procedural errors also occur due to improper checklist usage or a failure to follow standard processes or procedures. Error management refers to the process of correcting an error before it becomes a consequence to safety. And the term I like to use when we deal with errors is we repair the errors. You might have noticed on the slide, I didn't mention it, is we prepare for threats. By identifying the threats, we can prepare for them, mentally get ready to address them, and we're, we're just a little bit better mentally in case a threat does appear during our, our flight or our operations. So let's do a quick review. Threat and error management is a major component of risk management training. The purpose of crew resource management or threat and error management training is to maintain safe operations through effectively managing risk in our operations. Operational threats will exist and are best managed through planning and briefing. Taking the time to prepare for these threats allows for the application of a sound risk management strategy. I can guarantee you human error will happen and is best managed through monitoring, cross-checking and workload management. When you identify an error, you repair it and return to safe operations. Unwanted aircraft states are the results of mismanaging errors. When you identify an unwanted state, you recover and return to normal operations. Failure to do this could result in an incident or an accident. And what we've got on the screen now is the completed model. So keep in mind, we prepare for threats, we repair errors, and we recover from unwanted aircraft states. During pre-flight, um, well, let me back up. When we talk about unwanted aircraft states, that's kind of an insidious term and you're probably scratching your head a little bit saying, Mike, what do you mean by an unwanted aircraft state? 
Well, some of these could be lining up for the run what wrong runway at an airport with multiple parallel runways or intersecting runways with numbers that are very similar. Um, exceeding the uh, airplane flight manual or POH limitations. Landing sh long on a short runway requiring maximum braking to stop before the end or perhaps over banking during a maneuver. These are all unwanted aircraft states. And is, if we can manage those effectively, we can restore margins of safety um, to our flight operations. And, and, um, and conversely, poor flight crew re uh, responses could result in, in an incident or an accident, which is really what we don't want to happen. That's what we're trying to avoid. Here we go. This is, this is the complete model here. And again, you'll notice we got threats, errors. That's not an acronym. UAS is not an acronym. It's just unwanted aircraft states wouldn't fit in the point of the model. So I had to abbreviate it. That's why I printed it on the side. And we do not want to end up with the incidents or the accidents. That's not where we want to function. So threat and error management is a major component of risk management training. The purpose of crew, re crew resource management Threat and error management training is to maintain safe operations through effectively managing risk in our activities. Operational threats will exist and are best managed through planning and briefing. Taking the time to prepare for these threats allows for the application of sound management strategy. Unwanted aircraft states are the results of mismanaging errors. When you identify an unwanted state, you recover and return to normal operations. Failure to do that could result in an incident or an accident. So during pre-flight, to make this even simpler and drive it home, you should ask yourself the following questions. What are the anticipated threats for this flight? How do I prepare for them? Instructors, ask your students these questions and make them come up with answers. Try to keep them practical. Mountains, when I'm flying in Florida would not be an, a reasonable threat. Mountains in Iowa are not a threat. But if we go to Colorado or we deal with the Appalachians like we have in West Virginia and Virginia, they do become a threat for our operations potentially. Alligators are not a threat in Northern Virginia. So I wouldn't consider them. So if you're working with students, have them try to keep the threats realistic for the environment they're working in. During post-flight, you'd ask the questions, what threats were identified? How did I prepare for them? Do a follow-up on what you did. This is your validation that the questions you're asking and the answers you're coming up with are effective. What errors were identified? How did I repair them? We're always gonna be off heading. We're always gonna be off altitude. So that's two errors I make every time I get, by, get in an airplane. I'm off heading, I'm off altitude a little bit. What do I do? Diligence to my heading indicator and altimeter keep me work, keep me honest. And I, I correct them by climbing or descending back to the appropriate altitude. Did I have any unwanted aircraft states? If I was practicing steep turns, did I overbank? Was I did I stall during a slow flight exercise? Those are things that I want to uh, grade myself on. You can also uh, when it's um, when you get down to it when you're I usually do this when I'm pushing the airplane back and tying it down. What went well during the flight today? Why did it go good? What could have gone better? Why? What can I do to be better prepared for the next flight? How can I better prepare? By doing this, it allows me to self-evaluate how the flight went and reinforce the risk management principles that we just talked about in the threat and error management model. Again, if this is a dual flight, the instructor would prompt these questions from the student during the post-flight debrief. So when we use this model, what it really does is it, it helps instill good practices in our flying, in our airmanship, in our risk management procedures. It improves our aircraft operations 
And it's a good tool to diagnose accidents, incidents, and pilot technique, um, especially when we are deviating beyond human error and into actual systemic system improvement. It helps us do a better overview of, of our operating environment, and it helps us identify that we can report to the FAA, we can report them to ASRS on a NASA report. We can let our chief instructors or instructors know at the flight schools where we operate. So these systemic issues can be addressed where we have control and the ability to do that. So threat management is really all about managing your future. Error management is about managing your past and it's a, uh, designed to continue building a safety culture by encouraging open, honest communications. Any questions about threat and error management as a risk management model? Thank you so much, Mike. I don't look like, it doesn't look like we have any questions and I was looking at the chat, no questions there right now either. So uh, I've, I've obviously either done a real good job of trying to simplify this or I've really confused everybody and it's up to Tim and Tracy to straighten it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, I thought you, you did a fantastic job. You clearly, uh, you, know, you did a great job distilling it all down. I think what I was thinking through as you were going through everything was just the idea of keeping you from being complacent. Um, and I think that to me was really the, uh, the takeaway for me. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, if anybody has questions that you might think of, uh, you know, as we move forward, feel free to put them in the chat or we can follow up at the end. Um, Mike, thank you so much. My pleasure, sir. Awesome. Um, how about we go with, uh, how about we transition into Tracy at this point? Tracy, how's that sound to you? Well, actually, uh, I was thinking maybe if Tim went next, because my topic is going to kind of reach back on threat and error management and uh, personal minimums also. So I think it'd be more effective that way. Sounds great to me. We can definitely do that. All right. Let me pull this up. And Mike, um, if anybody asks for your content, is that available or is that uh, going to be... Um, should they just reach out to you directly? I'm, I'm happy to send you the slide deck and you're welcome to put it on the website, Gabe. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Mike. All right, so just wanted to double check. Which do you see? Do you see the slide view or do you see my, uh, my notes view? Uh, I see in the slide view at this point. Notes <laughs> view? Yes. I see your notes, Tim. You see my notes? I, mean, I see yeah, your the next slides. I see everything. Bottom. Yep. There we go. How about there that? There you go. There you go. Sorry. Good. I can't have, I can't, Schwartz, I can't have you see my notes because there's a bunch of stuff in here about you. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want you to see that ahead of time. Um, well, thanks, Gabe. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, so my name is Tim Fisher. I'm a CFI double I MEI. Um, I, uh, I own, as Gabe mentioned, I own uh, Aero Elite Flight Training uh, here in Leesburg, Virginia. Um, I have been an instructor since 2002. I'm an Embry-Riddle grad, go Eagles. Um, and uh, I was an aeronautical science major at Embry-Riddle. My whole plan was to uh, become a commercial pilot right out of college, like uh, everybody promised me. Um, and quite frankly, I had the unfortunate um, uh, happenstance of just, I graduated in the spring of 2002, about four months or six months after 9-11. And in the summer of 2001, I had a job offer to fly for Colgan Air, flying Saab 340s. By April of 2002, that job offer had disappeared and uh, it was up to me to figure out what was next. And so I became an instructor and I started instructing, came back home where my parents lived here in DC area started instructing and have been instructing since 2002. I instructed for a flight school called AVED Flight School uh, from 2002 to 2018. And then in 2018, I started my own flight school uh, here in Leesburg, Virginia, and we've been going pretty strong uh, since then. 
Um, we've been, we've grown from about two airplanes to about 20 airplanes now in about a year and a half of, um, of being in existence. So um, everything's going really well. And the number one question I get uh, and I talk about with my with either my students or when I do stage checks for other instructor students is personal minimums. And to a lot of people's uh, to a lot of people's point, um, I also talk about personal maximums um, because minimums are one thing and maximums are another thing. And so we're going to kind of dive into this a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, and so for sure, if you have any other questions or anything, feel free to reach out to me, you know, um, raise your hand, unmute yourself, yell out your question, or I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer them as we go through. So let's start with the basics, right? What are personal minimums? Um, you've probably heard this saying before, you know, the FARs or legal weather minimums are just a starting point. You gotta develop your own minimums. And this is fantastic advice. The number one thing I talk to my students about is when you start training, whether it's you know, when, from zero time, your envelope for going flying is about this thin, it's razor thin. We need clear blue skies, we need no wind, we need a great looking airplane that goes flying because we want to have the best experience at you know, every single time. But my job as your instructor is to safely and I will say slowly grow that envelope as we go through training. So we'll get into five knot winds and 10 knot winds and 15 knot winds, or we'll go flying when it's 8,000 overcast or 5,000 overcast and then maybe 3,000 overcast. Um, will get you safely into scenarios that you will face because once you become a private pilot or once you become an instrument pilot, you're off and running. Like the leash is off. There's nothing I can do as an instructor. If you launch into bad weather, um, that's a bit on me for potentially not teaching you the right things. It's on you for launching into bad weather. And so we want to slowly and safely do this. Perfect example of this. This is now many, gosh, many years ago. Um, Gabe and I, after one of the Smokehouse Pilots Club meetings, were sitting down and talking about wind and what he was comfortable with and what I was comfortable with. And he said, well, what are you comfortable with? And I said, well, I'm comfortable up to about 25 knots in a Cessna 172. That's what I think I can, I know I can do because I've done it. And so he said, I'm not comfortable with that level of winds. And I said, okay, I'm you know, I don't do it on a regular basis, but let's go, let's go do crosswind landings. And so we found a day, it was about 18 gusting 25. It was mostly a crosswind and we went out to 172 and I said, all right, man, I'm gonna do a, a landing or two. I'm gonna show you how it's done. I'm gonna hand you the controls. You're gonna do one or two. Um, and let's, let's, let's grow this envelope a little bit. Um, and that's what we did. So, this is great advice, like develop your own minimums, make sure the legal minimums are just a starting point. But it really leaves out a very important portion of this, which is you have to have the discipline to stick to the personal minimums. It makes no sense if you say my minimums are 500 overcast. If it's lower than that, I'm not going flying. And then the next time you go flying by yourself, you're like, yeah, it's only 400. That's close enough to 500. I'm going. You got to stick to those minimums. When you don't stick to those minimums, that's the start to, to piggyback off of Mike's presentation. When things go bad, it's not one thing that happens that goes bad. It's a chain of events that goes bad. And very often not sticking to your own personal minimums is the first step forward into some chain that leads to an accident, an incident, or just a scary flight. So what's my definition? My definition of personal minimums, set of rules, guidelines, and procedures, for making a go no go decision that are pilot and situation slash airplane specific. So if I'm flying the beautiful Bonanza that's sitting behind Martin right now, I may have that's maybe got a beautiful G1000 and it's got a great autopilot in it and it's all set and it's ready to go. My minimums may be different than in a 172. And especially at that Bonanza, I can't tell, but 
um, if it's you know flighted to no icing and things like that, that my minimums may be different for that Bonanza than they are for a 172 or for a Piper Cub or a Cessna 140. Um, and so these minimums may change. They may also depend on how you're feeling that day. We're gonna get into that. Um, and for those professional pilots in here, there's a lot of times where these personal minimums are more company minimums. I mean, think about the weather that airliners launch into on the regular. It's not if they're going, it's when they're going and let's go. And that's different than, that's a different line of thinking than we do in GA. So, all right, we've decided we definitely need personal minimums. Let's develop these. Now what? How do we do this? Um, here's my overall personal advice. There's a ton of sayings, as, as Mike said, there's only about a kabillion um, uh, different ways of doing things. There's, there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, folk sayings. There are no, there are bold pilots, there are old pilots. I, it, you know, we can go through those a million times. Um, my advice, flying should be fun. Your personal minimums should ensure that that remains the case every time you go flying. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out, I've met a student out, They've said, let's go flying. And I'm like, okay, well, it's gusting to 26. Um, and there's a, there's a moderate, there's an air met for moderate turbulence out there. Yeah, 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 I wanna go flying. Okay, tell you what, I'm gonna save you money. Just walk over to the wall, bang your head against the wall for 27 minutes and you'll save yourself 300 bucks because that's all we're gonna do today is just gonna bang our head against the top of the airplane and it's gonna cost you $300 to do so. That doesn't make sense to me. We wanna have fun. Let's skip today, let's pick a better day, and let's go forward. So um, at the end of this presentation, there's gonna be a bunch of links and I'll, I'll, I'll post this presentation out on uh, Smokehouse. I'll send it to Gabe, we can email it out to everybody. Um, a lot of the pictures you're gonna see are taken from directly from an FAA safety uh, briefing on developing personal minimums. Who knows better than st the stuff about this than the FAA? I figured, hey, this is great. Let's do this. So let's start with an experience summary. What is our certificate level? What are our ratings? What are our endorsements? When did we do our last IPC? When did we do our last flight review? When did we last fly? What is our recency experience? Um, this is last 12 months. I would highly encourage you maybe to do last 12 months, but also do last 60, 90 days, 30 days, something like that. Um, and let's track this stuff. Um, numerous times I've been flying with people and said, hey, when's the last time you flew? I don't, I don't know. Uh, it was like three weeks ago. Okay. And then I go sign their logbook after the flight and I find out it wasn't three weeks ago. It was three months ago. Well, th that's two very different things. Um, so let's get a sense of what our experience is right now. And then from there, we can move forward into developing our minimums because these minimums are going to change. So we said in the first slide, FARs, legal minimums are the starting point. So here's just weather minimums, VFR, marginal VFR, IFR, and low IFR. Well, if we're a private pilot and we walk out to the aer airport and the ceiling is 800 feet overcast, well, there's not much we can do. We're not an IFR pilot. We can't go flying. We should turn around and go home. Um, how current are we in those conditions? I'm an IFR rated pilot. I just happened to get an IPC because it had been a while for me. Um, so how current am I in flying? I'm pretty current right now. Uh, four weeks ago, not current at all. Would not have launched into low IFR to save my life because I, I, I don't want to do that. Um, and sometimes this, the last question is the most important question. What equipment is on board the airplane? That makes a big difference for a lot of us. If I've got G1000 and I've got a GFC 700 autopilot that I know and I'm, and I'm current with and I know exactly which buttons to push and I can launch into 300 overcast and immediately turn the autopilot on and reduce my workload as a single pilot IFR, maybe I launch into low IFR. If I'm flying a steam gauge 172 um, with no autopilot and I'm about to hand fly it up to Massachusetts, I don't know that I wanna be launching into IFR, especially low IFR in that realm. So knowing what equipment's on board will also help us develop these personal minimums. And we may have different minimums for different airplanes. This is something that instructors um, 
have to deal with on a daily basis. You know, my, my flight school, Air Elite, we have a wide variety of airplanes. And I love that about our flight school. We've got 172s with steam gauge. We've got 172s with G1000. We've got two Grumman Travelers and a Grumman Tiger. I don't know of another flight school in the area, let alone in this country that has multiple Grummans on their line. We've got a couple of Piper airplanes. Um, we, we've got a Cessna 140 tail wheel. We've got a Cessna 150. Um, I love our fleet it does put some pressure on my instructors to make sure they're remaining current in each one of these airplanes. And the, and one of the things we talk to our, to our pilots about is, Hey, you're, you know, let's stick with one airplane. Let's do your private pilot in a Cessna 172 with G 1000, let's say, but then once you're done with your private pilot, like, let's go get checked out. Let's try the low wing. Let's go try the tail wheel, get your tail wheel endorsement. Let's try these other airplanes. But as a pilot, we have to understand that that now means, yeah, we we flew six times in the last three weeks, but we flew in the Cherokee and I'm about to go fly in a 172. Well, I haven't flown in a 172 in six months. Am I really current or am I current in a Cherokee and not a 172? So for us, these are questions that instructors are constantly asking ourselves. Um, you know, I, tomorrow I'm going to go fly in. I actually texted the owner of one of our airplanes. I told him I'm going to go fly his airplane. I promised him that I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything bad. I wouldn't crash it. But I need to do some landings. It's been a while since I've done some landings. So I'm going to go take one of our Grumman's out. I'm going to do some trips around the pattern, uh, burn the pattern up a little bit, burn some ab gas. That sounds great. Um, and go do it by myself. I'm not gonna take a student with me. I'm not taking another instructor with me. I don't know that I really want anybody seeing these landings just in case, um, but that's something we as pilots have to keep thinking about. All right, so weather minimums, ceilings and viz. Is that all? Is that all we have to worry about? Perfect, I got these minimums completely out. Not quite. I sort of mentioned it a little bit earlier. What about the wind? And there's numerous factors to the wind. Could I land an airplane with 30 knot winds directly down the runway um, with zero gusts? Absolutely. And I bet you it would be one of my best landings in the history of mankind. All of a sudden, if we start adding gusts, we start turning that away from down the runway um, and we start giving ourselves a crosswind and a gusty crosswind. Well, now that starts to make things a little bit more difficult and we should um, factor that in here at the bottom on the on the picture you know this is just you know some some notes you know maybe surface wind we only say hey if i'm flying a single engine airplane 10 knots that's all i want um but if i'm flying a multi-engine they're generally a little bit heavier um a little bit more maybe a little more stable i can do up to 15 knots um but the crosswind i'm still only good for seven knots or whatever you can fill this out the other question is what about the runway you know, Leesburg, we're blessed in Leesburg. We've got 5,500 feet of nice, beautiful paved runway. If I'm going to Potomac and it's only 2,200 or 2,400 or whatever it is off the top of my head, that's a different story. Um, and am I flying into Falwell, which is like, seems like when you're sitting at the end of the runway in Virginia, it seems like it's almost a vertical runway. It's very, very weird. Um, am I flying into hot springs, which is, you know, whatever it is, 5,000 feet up in the air, whatever. These are all performance indicators that I need to be keeping in mind. So am I good at Leesburg with 5,500 feet and up to 20 knots? Sure. Am I good at Potomac at 2,000 feet with 20 knots? Maybe not. I can tell you that from, <laughs> from personal experience that when you get into the 25, 27 knot range, as, as I have, and, and a, a good good deal of crosswind, 22 knots of crosswind. Um, I used all 5,500 feet of Leesburg's runway to make sure I got down nice and safe and rolled out and nothing bad happened. Um, 2,200 feet, no chance I would have made it. I would have had to go someplace else. That just is not gonna happen. All right, so let's put this together. What you're going to sense potentially from me already and what you're going to get if you know me in a, in a bit is um, I am both serious and not serious at the same time. So let's assemble all of the stuff we just talked about. I'm a big Marvel guy. Avengers assemble. Let's go. And this may be might be something we look at for personal minimums, something that we put together that says, hey, 
VFR, marginal VFR. This is what I'm good with if I'm flying VFR, four miles viz during the day, eight miles viz at night, um, you know, and, and then wind speeds and all of that kind of stuff. IFR, I'm comfortable to 800 feet. Um, not sure why in this FAA doc they said uh, at night they were only good to 999 feet. Like, you know, at, at 1,000 feet, um, they were definitely good. At 999, they were definitely not good. Um, it seems a weird number, but you know, these could be our, our things, right? So we put this together and this, these are our baseline minimums. As you put your minimums together, um, I would highly encourage you to put them in a card, um, print them out, laminate them if you want to, put them in your flight bag, put them in your knee board, put them somewhere where you're going to see them. Um, that way, if you go flying when it's 2000 foot ceilings and you open your knee board up and your personal minimums are sitting there and they say 2,500, that's the minimum I can go. It may jog your memory that you do in fact have personal minimums and you should have the discipline to stick with them at all times. All right. So that's weather related. And when people think about minimums, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, what, what weather am I gonna do? What am I gonna, what am I gonna look at for weather minimums? What's the lowest ceilings? What's the maximum crosswinds I'm gonna do? But there's some other stuff we really need to take into account. So Mike mentioned this. My guess is Tracy's gonna mention this as well. I'm gonna mention it. Your instructors probably mentioned this 5,000 times. Um, I'm safe checklist. Ev before every single flight, you should be doing this checklist. I do this checklist before every flight. I ask my students before every flight, how are you on the I'm safe checklist? Obviously, some of these are super easy. Alcohol, actually, while I say that, alcohol as I take a sip of beer. Mm, that is delicious, Michelob Ultra. Um, okay. Alcohol, easy. We all know. We all know the saying: eight hours bottle to throttle. Okay, so for me, let's see. What is it? Eight p.m. All right, eight hours. Got it. No problem. Um, I'll do late morning. Um, those are easy. Um, illness. If I'm sick, if I've, <laughs> I'll speak on behalf of every of every organization on the planet. If you have anything resembling COVID, stay home for sure. Do not come in and fly. But even if I'm just um, a little sick, or I know I don't have COVID, but I've got allergies, or I've got, you know, whatever. Think about this. Um, it will only take you one time to have a cold and have a little stuffiness around the nose and go, meh, I'm fine. I'm going to go fly. And you go fly and you get up to 5,000 feet in cruise, and you're like, man, I feel fantastic. I don't, I'm so glad I didn't cancel this flight. I feel phenomenal. And then you're gonna descend back down, the pressure's gonna change, and you are gonna get twice as stuffy as you were before you left. You're gonna get all the pressure and you're gonna feel twice as bad. Um, so if you're ill, don't fly. Um, but there's, there's some other ones that are a little more subtle. Um, fatigue, if you're falling asleep, please don't fly. Um, if you're, you know, most of us are generally tired. Um, we've got kids, we've got a job, we've got a spouse, um, we've got co-workers and friends um, that may keep us up. Um, if you're super tired, don't go fly. But some of us, you know, we go on what a normal routine is. Emotions are the same thing. If you are on one end of the spectrum, super, let's say super angry, um, don't go fly. It, you're not going to be able to focus. You're not going to be able to um, do what you need to do. Um, stress is one of the more subtle ones. Let's not kid ourselves. Everybody on this call right now, everybody in the entire world, um, we operate with some normal level of stress. I've got stress as a business owner. I've got stress with my, I mean, I'm a, I'm a business owner for the flight school. I also have a regular full-time job that I'm actually wearing their swag right now. Um, that takes most of my day and then my evenings are taken with the flight school and all that stuff. There's just a level of stress I have. Um, and I, and, and that's where I am. But if that level of stretch stress is more than what I'm used to, 
I've got more stress. Business maybe isn't doing good. My sales rep at the at the IT company I work with is put, is pounding me to you know get something going. Um, that will now factor in. I am now overextended, and maybe this is not the best time for me to go flying. Um, medication is also a little more of a subtle one, and I'm going to use an example here: um, allergies. So. I live in Virginia. I never had allergies until I lived here for a while. And now all of a sudden I have allergies every year, um, usually twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring. Um, and allergies can be a little different. You have to understand because in some, at, so, so let's talk about medication. Um, some allergy meds, perfectly fine. FAA signs off on them. Claritin, Allegra, no problem. You can fly on Claritin and Allegra. Zyrtec, no. Sudafed, no. And it makes sense when you start thinking about it, right? Zyrtec, Sudafed, they have, uh, they're all antihistamines, but Zyrtec and Sudafed have uh, some qualities in them that may make you drowsy. And obviously we don't want drowsy pilots flying. So um, for us, you know, you have to know this. There's a ton of resources out on the internet for finding, AOPA does a great job of tracking medications that you can and cannot take. Um, and like I said, some of them are going to be different. Um, and you have to know this before you go flying. All right, so one more, one more uh, acronym here. We've had I'm safe. Same thing with PAVE. PAVE is a checklist we go over as students, uh, as instructors with students. Um, stands for pilot, aircraft, environment, and external pressures. Pilot, I'm safe checklist. You want to check it. You want to check that out. You want to say, hey, am I good to go? The aircraft, standard aircraft stuff. Do we have the aero documents, uh, all of those documents in the airplane and ready to go? Has the airplane complied with all of the aviate checklists? So annual, VOR checks, 100 hour if it's for hire. Um, altimeter, transponder, ELT checks, um, and when they're due. Does the airplane comply with all this stuff? Is the airplane actually airworthy? Can we actually go flying? We say we can go flying. We have all of the documents we need on our, on our person to go flying. Is the aircraft actually able to go flying for us? Um, and then the environment. We talked about weather. Are there other things in the environment we also need to be considered of, considering of? TFRs. Uh, these are pretty big around the DC area. January 20th, no fly zone out of Leesburg, Virginia. Don't even think about coming to the airport. These are things we have to be considered of. The one that I think um, doesn't get enough um, uh, look into is the external pressures. So as a student pilot, you have, um, you've got a fail safe. Me as the instructor, Schwartz is the instructor, any of the other instructors that are on board today, we're, we're your self, a fail safe. We're the ones where you say, hey, let's go. Yeah, who cares? It's moderate gusts and your know, moderate chop and it's 25 knot gusts, we're going. And Schwartz and I can look at each other and go, not only are we not going, you need to go home. Like we're not, we're not doing this. We're not messing around with this today. We're your fail safe when you become a pilot or when you become an IFR pilot or take any other additional steps, um, those fail safes as instructors don't exist anymore. You know, we're not there to say, to hold your hand and go, ah, maybe you shouldn't be there. Now, in some aspects we are as flight schools. Um, I'm going to withhold the name for, to, to, you know, not prosecute the innocent, but I've had a very new private pilot um, waiting around to go flying one day, it was 800 overcast. And I finally asked him, what the hell are you doing? It's 800 overcast. Why are you here? You just got your private pilot's license three weeks ago. And he said, um, oh, I've got a pilots and pause mission to go to. And I'm like, but it's, it's the weather today is going to be bad like all day. Like what, what are you doing? And I'm going to go back. Um, to this slide, slide over, where is it? 
weather minimums. Go back to this slide real fast. He produced something very similar to this and said, hey, as soon as it gets above a thousand feet, it's marginal VFR, that's still VFR, I'm gonna go. And so as the chief flight instructor of that flight school at the time, I had the authority to then tell him in nice and somewhat not so nice terms that he wasn't going. I was going to refuse to allow him to go because he waited until it got to 1100 feet and he was like, all right, I'm out of here, there we go. And I'm like, wait a minute, how are you getting over the ridge? How are you getting over here? What are you gonna do around here? And his basic premise was, I'm gonna scud run until I get to better, better VFR conditions and then I'll climb and I'll head down there. And so I put the nicks on that, said, nope, you're not doing that. We're not doing that. That's not what our flight school does. Go home, think about this, um, but go home. So he had this external pressure on him to go. He needed to complete this pilots and pause mission. Um, you have some internal pressures. Passengers are telling you, hey, we gotta go. Your friends are saying, hey, you're a brand new private pilot. We can't wait to go flying with you. Let's go. And you're thinking, oh man, I don't know if it's really the best day to go. And they're pressuring you to go. Um, these are all the pressures you gotta be thinking about and printing that personal minimums card out and going, no, you know what? It's, it's 1500 foot overcast and that's below my minimums. I can't go. Um, these are all things we need to be thinking about at all times. All right, so give me an example, Tim. This sounds great, but you know, let's let's you know put your money where your mouth is. I don't have to. AOPA does all the work for me. That's why I'm a member. Boom. You're a VFR pilot. They make a VFR pilot checklist. It goes through how many hours have you flown in the last 30, 90 days? How many hours in type in the last 30, 90 days? What's the weather? What is this? It has a little checklist. You sign it. You can have a CFI sign this thing. I pulled this right from their website. This is a great little checklist. I'd add a couple of things maybe to it, but this is a great VFR pilot personal minimums. They call it a contract, which I love. It's a personal minimums contract between you, yourself, and anybody you may be flying. All right, that's great. It's a VFR pilot. Tim, I ain't no VFR pilot, man. I got 1500 hours. I got my IFR. I'm ready to go get this VFR pilot stuff out of here. Give me another example. All right, I got you. You know what? I'm gonna lean on AOPA again. They've got an IFR one too. Look at this. And it's got even more stuff in there. It's got stuff about rain and snow and mixed weather. It's got runway lengths. It's got at minimum, this is what my overall wellness should be. Am I well? Am I okay? Am I very well? Am I adequate? If you're adequate, if you're checking adequate, do not fly. Just let's be clear. But it's got all of this stuff on there that you can sit down and say, okay, this is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I want to do. All right. So with that, I've got literally one more slide. First, here's the links to all of the resources. Don't write these down. We'll send these out. I'll even put them on Smokehouse as a, as a, as a thing. We'll send the slides out and everything. But there's the FAA safety. I grabbed a ton of the information in this presentation from that. There's the IFR and VFR personal minimums contract. Um, by the way, don't have to be an AOPA member to hit those links. I didn't have to log in. You just go to those links, it prints out. Um, it's a PDF you can print out. Um, and then uh, there's an EAA, a really good EAA link uh, with go, no go decisions with like six or seven questions you should be asking you. I thought that was good. I'll put it in. I'll put a couple more stuff in here as well before we go through. Um, but with that, thank you. Uh, and I will open it up for questions while I take another sip of beer. Leading by example, leading by example. <laughs> Always. How many people on the call have established the, the personal men's the way that Tim had outlined it on those last few slide decks? Raise your hands. It would be super hypocritical if I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> Tim, that was fantastic. And um, you know, the resources that you provided are 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 great. And I think that's a good re it's a good reminder, honestly, to go back through that and, and really take a look and remember how proficient you actually are. Um, 
How ha yeah, how I, many times have you I will noticed somebody coming in or you know you sitting down and you ask them about the the mins or the max and and the, and it's just zero like there's nothing there like how many times does that happen? It's you know I, I've been very lucky so the 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 students I work with um, I make sure of this right like we're we're trying to push out pilots that will adhere to their personal minimums. I, I, you know, you can, I don't think any of my students are actually on here. Although I think I've flown with, with Johnny before. I, I, that may have been a long time ago. Um, but um, one of the things I tell everybody, again, there's a ton of acronyms in aviation. We all know that there's a ton of sayings, whether they're true or not. We all agree. We all, we all say again, the, there's no old pilots. There's no bold pilots, all that kind of stuff. Um, my students hear from me all the time, especially in the beginning. They hear the little envelope talk. Um, they hear from me, I'm in this for fun. I am not in this to make tons of money. Um, quite frankly, nobody in aviation is in this to make tons of money. Um, so I want flying to be fun. I don't want to be beat up in an airplane. I don't want to do that. Um, so I truly abide by the I would rather be in the in the on the ground looking up at the air thinking I should be flying than in the air looking at the ground going man I really wish I was down there um, because I got myself into some situation so for me it's an easy decision should you go or not go should be a very easy decision you shouldn't really have to think about it if you start thinking about it for any amount of time that should tell you one thing and one thing only you should not be going flying today if you're sitting here, and I've done this with students, I've hemmed and hawed, well, you know, it's a little bumpy, uh, well, it's this, uh, well, it's that. Um, if we're hemming and hawing for 10 minutes, go home, don't go fly. Your, your head's not in it anymore. You're, not, you're, you're now worried about different things. That, that happens a lot, let's be clear. That happens a lot. But I have not had a ton of, of people come in where I've had to send them away because they were making bad decisions. Um, and usually people, whether they have it written down or not is, is a different story. I don't think many people have it written down as a card uh, to be quite honest. I don't, I have my own personal minimums in my head. Um, but doing this presentation and building it has kind of made me want to put it down in writing. Um, at least as a, you know, as, as a, to show the other instructors and students that I do have one in writing. Um, but not many people have it in writing, but a, a ton of pilots I know have it in their head. Oh, it's 15 knots. Nope. I'm out. No problem. Doesn't matter which direction that wind is going. 15 knots. I'm out. I'm doing it. I had one student who her only person, her basic personal minimum was, was it 65 degrees out or not? If it was below 65 degrees, she didn't go flying. She hated the cold. I don't blame her, by the way. If it was above 65, she was thumbs up. And then we'd start taking uh, uh, <laughs> pictures of how everything else was. But that was the first step. What's the temperature? 72. Boom. That's a good thing. All right. Now let's figure everything else out. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I would say. It, it honestly flying should be fun and it should be an easy decision. And if it's, if it's neither of those two things, you're, you're doing it wrong. And we, and we need to think about this. That's awesome. I, uh, you know, I'm one of those types of people and you know, this, I think, uh, probably better than anybody at this point, but the idea of, I mean, I, you have your mins and things like that, but you also have that gut feeling. And sometimes you're like, you know what? I'm just not feeling it today. I'm not going to go. Um, I, I do. Uh, I'm a big gut fan, uh, you know, trusting your gut. So I just share that as something that I've gone through. The other thing that I did, um, Tim, is also um, posted that video. You and I had a video a long, long time ago about our that flight that you we, you, we were doing all the crosswinds. So I posted that in the, the feed. It's amazing when you look at that and you hear the AWOS of what you were going through. Um, that was pretty cool. And, and I appreciated that flight. That was back in, I think, 16 or 17. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think um, um, I, I will say this about that flight. Um, it was not, if I remember correctly, it was not super hot out that day. Right. I was sweating profusely after, <laughs> after that flight going through those landings. Um, and you made a fantastic decision during that flight, which I've made fun of you for the wrong reasons about for years, calling you chicken. In truth, it was a fantastic decision. We went out there. I did three landings. After the first one, I said, do you want to do it? And you said, no, go do another one. Let me watch again. Okay, perfect. I did a second one. All right, you want to do one? 
no, do a third one. Let me watch again. Okay, cool. I did my third one. I said, all right, you want to do a, do you want to do one? And he said, nope bring me back in. This is outside of my expertise. And we taxi yep. back in. So I got three landings in. It was perfect. Yep. Um, but uh, you made the decision. You're like, I don't know what 25 knot winds look like. And we went up and you're like, okay, now I know. And it's a no for me. It's an absolute no. It's a hard pass. Get me the hell out of here. Let's go get something to eat. And that's what we did. So I think it was a, it was a great learning experience in that aspect um, for, for you, for me. I mean, like, like I said, i one other story I'll share before I before I cede my time to Tracy because he's been super patient and and he now knows I'm long winded, uh, which he did not know before this. Um, which is um, I have when I talk about external pressures, um, this sounds stupid. The best of us can get pushed into those external pressures. I'll give you two quick stories. Number one, um, I was going flying with a student. His dad was a FedEx pilot those dudes launch into absolutely everything. The wind was 24 knots gusting to 29. He showed up with his son. I said, I texted you guys an hour and a half ago. It's terrible. We're not going to go. He said, no, I want my son to experience this. And I'm like, we're like pre-solo. Like this is not a good idea. And he kept hammering me and I acquiesced. And his student and his son and I walked out to the airplane. We took off. We got about nine miles away from Leesburg. I happened to look over at him. He looked white as a ghost. And I said, are you okay? And he said, no, take me back. And I'm like, good decision. We turned around. He hadn't even gotten the controls yet. We turned around. We came back in. I landed. I used all 5,500 feet of the runway because it had basically gone to 29 knots on a direct crosswind out of Leesburg, which was not forecast. Um, and I used all 5,500 feet of Leesburg's runway. We taxied back, we shut down. Um, I was terrified he wasn't gonna come back and uh, not exaggerating this and also not my finest moment. Um, I sent the son in to our, to, to our flight school to go in and I told him to get a bottle of water, go relax, just chill. I took his dad to the side. Um, I may or may not have pushed him up against a wall with one hand and looked him in the eye and said, if you ever do that to me again, you're done. I'm not flying with your student or with your son. I'm not doing this again. Don't ever put me in that position again. Um, you scared your own son half to death and we don't want this. Uh, he realized it when he saw his son walk in and saw him a shade of white that he had never seen his kid before that he had made a mistake too. So at that point, I mean, I'm, I've got not a ton of hours. I've got about 2,500 hours. Most of them are as an instructor. Um, at that point, uh, I got pressured into it. I, that external pressure pushed me into a flight that I did not want to do. Now, luckily, I was experienced enough to pull myself out of that, but an, another pilot would not, may not have been able to do that. So it happens to everybody. It's not something that, oh, I hit 250 hours and great, I don't have to worry about external pressures anymore. I've got 2,500, I still deal with them on a daily basis. So remember that, but um, just keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's something that, that needs to be in the back of your mind at all times. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to say before you shared that story was be confident in the decision that you make. Right. And, and have no shame in what it is that you believe you need to be doing when you need to do it. Um, so thank you for that, Tim. Tim, great job. This is awesome. And um, can't wait to, uh, if you're open to that, putting those slide decks on the website, like you said, too. Well done, buddy. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm going to go off uh, video because I'm going to go eat dinner. I'm going to listen to, I want to listen to Tracy, but I'm going to go eat dinner and you guys don't need to watch that. So I'm going to go off video and, and, and mute as well but uh, I will cede my time to Tracy. Awesome. All right, Tracy, you're up at ADM and Flight Standards. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and, and doing All this. All right, yeah, thanks, Gabe. Thanks for having me. I appreciate, yeah. uh, like, like I said, you, you're putting these things together. This is a really positive contribution to aviation safety. And uh, can you guys see the screen okay? Sure can, yep. Great. Perfect. All right, so well, I'm, let me kind of minimize some of this other stuff over here. My chat windows are also showing up. I figured I could uh, keep that up to see 
what everyone's doing. So yeah, I'm single screen also. So if anyone needs to interrupt me, just speak up. Uh, I'm not able to look at the chat or anything like that to see what's going on. But uh, yeah, Tracy White, again, talking about flight standards. I'm basically building on um, what Mike and Tim were talking about. Personal standards is probably the core of what I'm talking about here. But in my background, uh, military, airline, charter, and now kind of corporate, uh, the flight standards manual um, is basically the Bible, how we operate. Everything I need to, anytime I need to reference anything uh, for training, check rides, or just how I'm going to fly the aircraft and how I'm going to operate it in general, I reference the standards manual. It's the one place I go to. Um, and you can see it's nothing new to general aviation. There's a little picture of a Cessna 172 standards manual. And I've got some links to some examples that I found for general aviation in the back. Um, and again, I can share these slides also if anyone's interested. I've got a lot of links throughout uh, that I think are great stuff to reference. And, and I learned a lot even uh, uh, researching this topic to present this in terms of how to tailor this to general aviation. And when I talk about aeronautical decision making, I found, like Tim said, um, when you come up with a set process, set standards and limits for all this stuff, as long as you adhere to those, it makes it easy. He talked about, yeah, the airlines, you know, launching anything, if the, if the minimums are there, they go. And yeah, we got a lot more capable, uh, capable aircraft, more equipment on board, de-icing, onboard weather radar and stuff like that that makes that a lot easier. Um, but, you know, sometimes you launch in some pretty hairy weather and sometimes we cancel, sometimes we do divert. Um, and using the flight standards, uh, it makes it easy. I don't have to guess. And, and I've been there before in a small airplane having to guess, should I go or not? And uh, I'll elaborate on some of that as I go along. So me in a nutshell, again, since I'm kind of the new guy here on the West Coast, some of you guys all know each other, just in case someone's like, Tracy, you don't even look like a pilot. What do you even know about airplanes? Um, I started my aviation career in 2001, uh, just before 9-11. I joined the Navy as a Naval Flight Officer. So I'm the guy in the back seat, not a Navy pilot. Um, although I started in the T-34, you see there on the top left, they started me up front and showed me some pilot stuff, which I was able to use to get my civilian ratings, helped a lot. Uh, but I sit in the back and do navigation and weapons. Uh, in the fleet, I flew on P-3 Orions, the four-engine turboprop you see down there. Uh, we're submarine hunter and reconnaissance aircraft. And I did that for eight years until I got out. And you know, I've been flying in the reserves ever since, um, since 2009 up in Whidbey Island, Washington. Uh, but I got out, I was in Memphis, uh, went to work as a flight instructor, followed my wife up to St. Louis for her job and worked as a flight instructor up there. So a couple of years of doing that before I got enough hours to fly for Trans States Airlines and Embraer 145 out of St. Louis. So that got me over to a lot of you guys neck of the woods in the Dulles, uh, Richmond, Roanoke area um, up over there in the eastern uh, seaboard quite a bit. Uh, and then we moved again, 2013, came out here to Portland, Oregon. So I started flying Dash 8s for Horizon Air, which is the regional carrier for Alaska Airlines. And then, um, so a couple of years regional flying, or two years at uh, Horizon until I decided regional pay wasn't gonna cut it for me. So I went to go start flying King Airs uh, as a contractor to the Air Force, flying MC-12s, doing reconnaissance overseas, then came a little closer to home, uh, flying for wheels up, doing the King Air stuff all over North America. Part 135 until I landed at my current operation. I fly, uh, I, I say corporate flight department, I fly for the regional uh, power administrator for the Department of Energy here in Portland. Uh, we fly uh, a King Air 350 and then we have some helicopters and, and even a drone uh, that we do a lot of the work we do. So I, I do kind of corporate stuff. I just carry people to meetings while the helicopter does. Guys do a lot of real dangerous, uh, cool stuff. Um, that's far from anything I would ever ever do, but uh, we used to be a part 135 operator, following the same guidelines like I did at Wheels Up and other charter stuff. Now we're part 91, we're general aviation, but we're is BAO certified, and that's uh, international standards for business aircraft operations, uh, much like ISO 9000, if you've ever heard of that from manufacturing organizations. It basically certifies that we uh, hold, uphold ourselves to a higher level of safety. We're required to have a formal safety management system, formal uh, training and check-in requirements and a maintenance program uh, and have a general operations manual and standard operating procedures. So a quick look at where we're at today in general aviation. Uh, probably no surprise to any of you guys. We know the general aviation accident rate has come down uh, a little bit over the last 20 years, but not a whole lot. And the bottom line there at the, the bottom number there is the accident rate. In general aviation, you're more than 16 times more likely to have an accident. Well, I'm, I'm not talking fatalities here, but just to get in an accident, vice the combined accident rate of 121 and 135 operators. 
And of course, this affects us all. Uh, whether you own an airplane, you probably noticed your insurance rates went up last year. I know AOPA's uh, Aviation Safety Institute, I put a link to a video down there at the bottom you can find on YouTube or, or their website. And they mentioned that you know insurance rates uh, by and large went up from 10% up to sometimes 100% last year. Uh, and these were the three cases that they found were the costliest. In, in aggregate, these three things obviously don't um, cost as much individually as a, a total whole loss or loss of life, but in aggregate, they happen so frequently that this is what most of their payouts went towards. And if you look at these, I mean, uh, I'm sure sometimes year up landings happen because the gear just doesn't come down. Nothing the pilot can do about that, but execute a good year up landing. But most of the time we know this happens from just poor checklist discipline and poor cockpit management. Uh, and the picture you can see right there, if I believe it right from what I found online, uh, there was a hand prop uh, gone wrong. Uh, and I've seen this happen. I flew with a guy, I don't fly with him anymore, but I've seen a guy uh, hand prop an airplane and I offer to get it at the controls and do like the FAA recommends, have a competent pilot at the controls and you hand prop. And he says, oh no, here, I'll grab a rock and I'll put it on the tire if that makes you feel better. We don't fly anymore. But uh, that's the kind of stuff that can happen from, from things like that. <laughs> So all these things are preventable is what I'm getting at. So, you know, personal minimums is a, the foundation of everything I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about how you can use threat and error management to evaluate and, and change those personal minimums in, in a systematic fashion. So Tim mentioned the PAVE checklist, the I'm safe checklist. Um, if you're in route, the decide model is a good one when something pops up that's unforeseen, right? These are, are good models to be familiar with, right? It, it gets your mind thinking in the right mode. And I'm sure this has come up in, on all your check rides at, at some point, you know, at a minimum um, and, and probably throughout your training and other safety seminars that you go to like this. But to me, it kind of just, it paints everything with a broad brush, right? So personal minimums, that, that's more measurable, right? Tim was talking about putting specific numbers uh, to limits that you have. And we can go one step further in developing uh, some flight standards. And the more measurable they are, talking about threat error management, like Mike was talking about, it's hard to, um, it's hard to know you made a, an error if you don't have something to measure it against. And, and I saw that a lot. You know, one of the things I got to do for, um, uh, when I worked at Horizon Air was be a part of the uh, LOSA, which is Line Operations Safety Audit. These, these are the guys that developed threat error management back in the mid 90s when they did a project for Delta Airlines. And uh, it's now become something that we do in the Navy just in the last three years. Uh, and Alaska Airlines believes in, in, in it so much that uh, they were the, the first and I believe the only airline right now to make their pre-flight departure briefings threat based. Um, so having something specific um, to measure your operations against, you, you know, it's hard to really tell how many errors that you will make. And on average, the LOSA Collaborative found that, you know, if you board Southwest, Delta, or whoever to go on a flight somewhere, the pilots up front are probably going to make anywhere from 12 to 14 errors on that flight. That, that was an average uh, for a good flight that goes wrong. And as far as you know, it was perfect. Um, but they have a well-developed, very robust set of standards uh, that they measure about. So most of them are pretty un inconsequential 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. But I think in GA, in general, you know, we may have a, a it, it's a cultural issue, um, right? We, we, uh, I, I'm preaching to the choir here too, because you folks that take time out of your day to come be a part of a webinar like this and try to learn things and become better pilots and and be safer. Uh, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, right? You're obviously not the ones that um, are some of the stories that we hear about when you look at AOPA safety uh, seminars and hear some of these worst case scenarios. Uh, you guys aren't even giving wings credit for being here, uh, you know? So, but these are just some of the things that I've noticed. Um, Tim talked about difficulty making no uh, go, no go decisions, how personal men's can help with that and flight standards can as well. Uh, but also in flight, uh, here's a great video, this link right here, if any of you have ever seen this, uh, watch Flight Chops on YouTube. Uh, I had just happened to find this one episode and Dan Greider, by the way, uh, is a recent new member of Smokehouse Pilots. I don't know if he's on here tonight, but uh, be a great speaker to have in the future, uh, Gabe, if you ever get a chance to get him on there. But this specific episode, they're talking about um, the emphasis on stall recovery over stall prevention and they interview some airline pilots and some general aviation pilots and CFIs and um, 
two completely different paradigms there. It was really interesting to see if you haven't watched that. But um, when I flew the Dash 8, we had specific minimum maneuvering airspeeds, which is one of the big things Dan talks about in there and other videos he's been on um, for every configuration. You know, and that's something you probably, you know, you may not have thought about. Uh, even flying a Cessna 172, as safe as they are, you know, the bottom of the green arc, when your flaps down, that's when you're going to stall. But when you're maneuvering down low in the pattern or something like that, you know, the ACS puts a lot of emphasis on maneuvering speed being below that maximum VA. But there should also be a speed at which, you know, if you don't get below that, you won't come close to a stall. So stall prevention, if you focus and train to that, um, stall recovery should never become an issue other than a check ride or uh, recurrent wings issue um, events and stuff like that. And a lot of times I think there's just a general lack of standards in a lot of things we do. Um, it'll start with personal minimums, but I'll just introduce a few basic areas that, you know, maybe we may or may not have thought about too much. Uh, one of them being like minimum static power is one I ran into a long time ago as a flight instructor. If you're flying a fixed pitch Cessna 172, do you know what the minimum number on that RPM gauge is uh, when you first apply power before you accelerate and it raises? There's a number in there. It's probably not going to be in your POH, but I guarantee your maintainers know about it. And that could, something like that could be something to be, that you should be cognizant of, because if you don't reach it, uh, that should result in rejected takeoff. So how do we get there, right? It, it starts with personal means. That's the foundation of all of it. Um, and if you're just a VFR fairweather flyer that likes to stay close to the patch and uh, you don't really go anywhere if you don't have to, then personal men's is, is really about all you need. But if you are flying IFR, you are taking trips going some places, I, I really urge you to develop something a little more uh, once you get a good set of personal men's and just keep building on it. You know, starting with the basics, but then it just gets into, uh, like I said, defining ways in which you'll do every operation and it gives you a standard on which to measure your errors from. And then like Mike mentioned, you can use red error management to evaluate how those minimums are, are working for you. And one of the things that it does is prevents normalcy of deviation I mentioned there. One of the best ground instructors I've ever had, I've had him for recurrent in the King Air a few times. And I, he gets people caught every single time, you know, in, in twin engine, especially in, in uh, turbo props, you know, V1 is the speed at which before that we're gonna reject, after that we're gonna take off unless the aircraft just will not fly. But he, in a King Air, it's pretty small, right? We're basically a souped up beach barren. So he puts people on a 12,000 foot runway and you just rotated. Now you got an engine fire or something serious like that. And he tricks people every single time into saying, well, yeah, I'm gonna put it down right away. You know, he can get them to um, violate their standards if they have them because, you know, we can start talking ourselves into this normalcy of deviation and deviating from these standards pretty easily if they're not written down and if we don't have that contract like 10 mentioned. So I'll go through just a quick scenario. Uh, this is up in my neck of the woods just because I'm familiar with it. And uh, I'll go pretty quick here because this topic can be uh, go pretty long if we let it. Uh, let's say we've got a private pilot, Troutdale's right here in the Portland area, tower control, class D airspace, uh, going down to Northern California, about a three and a half hour flight. We've got an IFR rated pilot, he's current, uh, current with the BFR, it's been a little bit. Um, hadn't had an IPC since the instrument rating, but he's kept current on instruments. He's in an IFR certified airplane, pretty capable with 180 horse mod. He's got uh, 38 gallons of usable fuel. He's going to carry the full load. Uh, the pilot's got some experience in it over the last six months. We don't know exactly how much. Uh, there's a little external pressure there for you. And just to show the total load, let's say, you know, he's figured he's within weight and balance. So that's not an issue. There's the runway here at Troutdale, plenty long for a Cessna 172 below its useful low. There's the weather, we can see it's, it's VFR. It's, it's showing light rain, but up here, that's usually just a slight drizzle that lasts for about three months. Um, but five miles and 3,900 feet is what we're focused on. And 15 degrees, I, I kind of manipulated that. It's a little cooler than that these days, but um, uh, just to, to show that it's pretty fair weather. No applicable uh, nodums or anything like that. Again, I manipulate the temperatures here because realistically this time of year, you're just not gonna make this flight. Uh, and the MEA goes up to 6,400 once you turn southbound there, but um, past the OTH, the North Bend VOR. But uh, you know, I'll say the freezing levels at 7,000, 7,500, going up to about 8,000 further along the route, takes 29 gallons and including an IFR reserve, the 35 gallons is gonna be the requirement. So he's got three gallons to spare, that's legal. 
And here's uh, Eureka, the destination. Uh, single runway, looks like another one was closed. 3,000 feet, the airplane takes about 1,350 to land over a 50 foot obstacle. So he's got plenty of room there. Uh, there's no weather reporting at Eureka though. So uh, Arcata, just about 10 to 15 miles to the north has uh, weather reporting as a METAR and a TAF. So we can see the current weather there is, is also VFR, a little marginal. The visibility gets better, but the ceiling comes down to about 2200 with uh, some gusty winds about 30 minutes after his arrival and no applicable notums or anything there. So on the surface, this looks like uh, a pretty doable flight. And there is an instrument, uh, a couple of instrument approaches there. It only has these two RNAV approaches. The GPS 12, uh, he'll expect to use that based on the uh, anticipated winds. And it gets down to about 800 feet with a mile and a half is if he's using cat B mins, uh, which he should be. That, that could be another thing I'll, I'll talk about here for developing in your standards, even though technically a Cessna would be uh, cat A for a straight in approach based on 1.3 times your uh, stalling speed. So looking back at our scenario, that was a quick glance over that, but uh, you know, weather men's, Tim hit a lot on that um, and, and how you should differentiate BFR versus IFR and day versus night. Like for my current operation, I mean, we're pretty capable in the King Air, but uh, things that we won't do is circling approaches at night, even though we train and check to circling approaches in IFR, we won't do them at night, regardless of the airports, because it's just not safe. Uh, a big thing I mentioned, Eureka has no weather reporting and it's a single runway. So it's a three and a half hour flight, a lot can happen. And here in the Northwestern part of the country, there's a lot of microclimates, especially close to the coast. So um, with my current operation, our standards are no weather reporting, it doesn't matter if it's clearing a million, we're filing, uh, filing an alternate and planning the fuel for it. Because uh, what, what else could happen, right? Someone gears up in front of you, right in the middle of the runway, now what are you gonna do? Uh, is that three gallons enough to get this guy to Arcata that's 15 miles to the north and still have the IFR reserve? Probably, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, and performance, uh, landing, here's a good one that, when I was coming up as an instructor, a lot of people would say, well, 1350, that was the, the uh, length required for this, this aircraft to land over a 50 foot obstacle, but um, you should add a buffer to that. Well, how much buffer are you gonna add? Uh, some would say 30%, some say 50. Well, here's the rules we use uh, and it makes it pretty cut and dry for me. Uh, we're required to land within 60% of the landing distance available. So in this case, that would be 2250, uh, well shorter than the runway that is going to, there's plenty of room. And then we're also in 135, we have some exceptions to allow us to go up to 80%. And part of that includes uh, for us, it's having an ATP and a minimum of 2,500 hours, but it also includes 100 hours PIC in the specific aircraft uh, and the, uh, the runway cannot be wet. So it, that gives us a little bit extra safety buffer, some extra proficiency and recency in the aircraft, uh, as well as ensuring that we have a clean, dry runway. Otherwise, we're, we're holding to that 60% rule and we would have to go somewhere else um, if we happen to run into rain that day. Uh, and just a few other topics here that, that you could consider to add to flight standards because we, we have them in our manuals. Uh, taxi and run-ups, a big one I've seen in general aviation. How close are you going to get to an obstacle before you either request a wing walker to come by or uh, just shut it down and tow it? I think probably five feet is, is a good one. Uh, I remember when I was a flight instructor once, we were all sitting in the FBO lobby watching this uh, uh, flight instructor and another student taxi out along the narrowest way to save them probably, you know, 30 seconds of taxi if they could have gone around the long way in the ramp in between the FBO building and the nearest aircraft on the ramp. And they're just eyeing the, what looked to be about six inches uh, that they have between their wingtip and another aircraft. And, you know, they could have just stopped and gotten someone to walk them by real quick, but they took the risk of, of uh, you know, going by there and scraping that wingtip. And now potentially, you know, if you're at an not at your home airfield, you've got an unworthy aircraft, you knocked out your nav lights or whatever like that. Uh, is that worth taxiing that close to an obstacle? Uh, and other things like um, sterile cockpits, a big one I just heard Max Trescott talk about on his latest pod, uh, podcast. And a lot of, it's not hugely emphasized in general aviation, but can be attributed to a lot of accidents in the past. So um, just moving on through each phase of flight here real quick. Take off and climb. I, min I mentioned uh, minimal static power. Uh, if you're flying a Cirrus or something like that, a lot of small airplanes are getting much more capable nowadays. So 
know, flight guidance and automation policy should be something that you consider. My personal goal uh, in flying IFR, whether I'm with a crew or by myself, is to touch as few buttons as possible. And that helps me be more focused on the, the duty of flying instead of messing with my EFB or my avionics and stuff like that. In cruise, another big one I've seen in general aviation, I, I believe there's still about one to 1.5, depending on the stats that you look at, uh, that many airplanes a week run out of gas in this country. And a lot of times I've asked people, well, how do you monitor your fuel, you know? Um, so just a good standard that we operate on, uh, any flight more than one hour, every waypoint in between top of cruise and top of descent, we have to check our fuel. So early on, we're gonna know if we get into a min fuel uh, situation and we're gonna have to either divert um, or, or change the plans, however it's gonna be, or if we maybe do have a malfunction uh, that we need to be aware of. Uh, flight following uh, is another one that I encourage a lot of people to really make a, a good standard practice. I can't count the number of BFR pilots. I was amazed to make a long cross country and not want to talk to ATC because they're just scared of it, uh, probably due to lack of experience. Um, weather warnings is another good one. You know, how do you have a specific limit that you're going to stay away from thunderstorms or heavy rain shafts? And then just set an approach, stabilized approach criteria. I'll just hark on that one uh, just to keep it short. But uh, years ago, I remember when this first was really introduced to general aviation, and a lot of people thought this meant just like the airlines, fully configured by a thousand feet, 10 miles out on a straight in ILS or whatever, you know. That's not necessarily the case. It's just having set standards for each phase of that approach, even on a visual approach from a downwind, minimum speeds and configuration gates, and by a certain altitude, you're you're on a certain speed, fully configured and ready to go. And then continuing down the touchdown zone, right? The FAA defines what that is. And I do the same way in a Cessna 172 as I did in a Dash 8. Um, if I don't touch down within the touchdown zone, that's first third of the runway or not to exceed 3,000 feet, we're going around. Um, landing rollout discipline, you know, are you gonna talk to ATC or start messing with the flaps while you're still running down the runway? And, and uh, at what speed are you going to slow down to before you're trying to make that nine degree turn? Uh, could you make a difference there if it's wet out? Uh, and I would. Back to those cost of insurance claims, loss control on the ground was one of them. And that's not exclusive to tailwheel aircraft. And this could be a very scenario where I could see a, a tricycle gear aircraft uh, getting into that sort of scenario. An abnormal and emergency checklist. I mentioned rejected takeoff. You know, how many of us have done and trained to that in your single engine aircraft? But I've had to do it in a, in a small uh, general aviation aircraft before. Uh, we train to it regularly in multi-engines and you know, anyone with a multi-engine rating, I'm sure you've done that as a regular part of your training. Uh, but how are you gonna handle these things in addition to what the checklist said? What sort of standards are you gonna um, put for yourself? An engine fire is a good one. Are you immediately going to try to secure, especially if that engine's producing power most of the time it is, I, I typically see this scenario in a twin engine because a lot of times people think they'll quickly secure that engine, get that fire out. But that, if that engine's still producing power, is that a good idea? And particularly up here in the Northwest where terrain's pretty much always an issue for us. So, um, you know, you might be able to get away with that pretty easily in, in a flatland area where there's not a lot of obstacles in the way. But uh, if you guys remember that ATR-72 that, went knife edge over that bridge in Taiwan that was captured on a dash cam a while ago. I think that was due to fast hands uh, going in the wrong engine quickly, right? So it's been proven, wait, <laughs> wait till you're at a safe altitude and have a methodical way to go through these sort of, uh, these sort of issues. And other standards to think about, Tim even mentioned rest requirements. You know, I think that's really important if you're gonna make that long cross country or a full day, you know, flight instructors have these sort of rest requirements, but if you're gonna make a long cross country to Oshkosh or something like that, or try to ferry that new airplane that you just picked up across the country, uh, really consider this because fatigue can and will creep up on you. Um, limitations for new aircraft is you get new equipment and stuff like that. I talked about recency. Those are good things to think about and add to those, those personal min minimums or your flight standards. Uh, and Tim also mentioned currency versus proficiency. We know those are two different things, right? Um, you have to have three and three every 90 days to be current and there's the night and the tailwheel issue, but you know, we all know that's not really proficient. Uh, in the military, what we do is it's six approaches, six takeoffs and landings every month. People don't get that, they're down, right? So just getting something that's a little bit better. Uh, and Assure Partners from AOPA also had a good presentation on this and mentioned, uh, or AOPA did, that 
assured gave lower insurance rates to people that showed a commitment to safety by doing wings uh, or you know more frequently check rides, um, doing anything above the FAA minimums, uh, and, and that they could show that. Like I said, unfortunately, we're not getting wings credit for this tonight. But then again, you guys are showing a commitment to safety, so doing things like this uh, can also help. You know, lower uh, the hit on your pocketbook as well. And training maneuvers too. You know, I got another good example here on this last this is the last slide here. The Utah State one right there. You know, I know Dave's working on your instrument rating. This is a really good one that also establishes standards for each maneuver, and it makes it easy. This is the way we train in the military. Before I ever stepped foot, my first airplane, the T-34, I knew exactly what to look for, pitch, power, trim, all that sort of stuff. And then when I saw it happen in real life, it was easy. I mean, um, you know, you did a lot of studying at that point, but it, it made for a lot less time in the aircraft uh, to be successful. So just a couple of good examples. Again, I can share this slide if anyone's interested uh, that I found online that are really good standards. Uh, they incorporate personal min minimums and also some of these other standards that if you live by them, I think we could all help um, cut down some of those incidents that I mentioned earlier. And the last couple are just some good articles that talk about people developing uh, standards and some things that you could consider. So that's all I have. I'll uh, give it back to Gabe. And again, I can share this. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Tracy, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, absolutely love it. And a, round, a virtual round of applause for you. Anybody on the call that has uh, any questions for Tracy? There's Mr. Schwartz again. Uh, you know what, I, you, you mentioned something right there at the end and I wrote it down uh, because it, it really stuck with me as well, but doing anything above the minimums, right? So not just sticking to those mins just because we have to have those, but doing everything you can to get above those and, and well beyond it. Um, it kind of goes back to what Tim was saying, you know, and, and not, or, I'm sorry, Mike, the idea of not being complacent and, uh, and, and all of that. Um, but uh, that, that was really, really great. Um, thank you again for putting that together. Any other questions? I just want to make sure that we cover anything that uh, Tracy has to offer. I'm so glad that you're representing Smokehouse Pilots from the West Coast. Um, that's pretty, pretty neat. Um, well, if no one has anything else, I do want to just thank everyone, uh, Tim, Mike, Tracy, for taking your time tonight, and, and of course, for everyone for uh, joining us. Um, I do want to just point out one thing. Ryan Burgess, I'm glad to see you on this call tonight. Um, I know you had a challenging day. And uh, I'm glad you were safe. I don't know if you want to um, touch on anything, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm glad you're doing well. I appreciate it. Thank you. For those that are Facebook friends with me, uh, it's been a long week. Um, two diversions, including declaring an emergency today, lost uh, alternator and uh, IFR training mission. Luckily, we were close to home and got home safely. Um, ATC, the tower asked us if uh, we wanted to declare. We had a little bit of moment of silence. It didn't quite go as I was thinking. I went ahead and declared because uh, Frederick is crazy busy and I wanted some priority for landing. There's some amount of discussion in our debrief on whether I should have just asked for priority instead of emergency based on uh, tower procedures. And we're still kind of talking through and walking through that. But uh, we turned the Cirrus safely. Luckily, we were really close to home, still had power all the way down. Actually, it was a really decent landing. My landings have not been stellar lately in instrument training, but a great landing despite all the stress. One thing I found interesting in thinking about it, and after I, Bill English was, Bill, I don't know if Bill's still on here. Bill was texting me as, as we we're rolling up on the ramp to park. So Bill was the first to know. Um, after I talked to a few people today and, and talked to Gabe, I, I was still sitting on the ramp. And uh, one of the things occurred to me that I thought was a little bit odd that I'm still digesting. Um, I was cognizant and aware of all radio calls to us. Um, there was never any miscommunications with Tower. I will tell you compared to other times when I'm listening to Tower, I don't recall hardly anything Tower said to anyone else. And I'm still kind of digesting that. My instructor put it off as tunnel vision, um, but that, that was uh, one thing I'm taking away that I'm kind of digesting. Obviously, whether or not to declare an emergency, I think our culture is changing to go ahead and declare. 
uh, and I don't feel bad about that, but uh, it was nice to get down and uh, maintenance can take care of and see what our electrical issue is and live to fly another day. Well, well done and uh, glad you're good. And hey, um, welcome to plane ownership, I guess. Something that I don't you know, necessarily know yet, so. Yeah, I didn't have any M MX issues <laughs> until lately. And now it's all of a sudden like every week. My, Mike Walpole and I actually put the same aircraft down in uh, Winchester after takeoff the other day. We had a CO alarm go off on takeoff and we just turned her back around and put it down and never found the source of it, never could replicate it, but uh, better to be safe than sorry. So I, I had two forced landings in a week. I'm, I'm flying commercial to Colorado for a week and hiding. Yeah, and have a, have a uh, Bloody Mary on the flight. Um, great to see you, man. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, um, real quick, so next week, uh, January 21st at 7 p.m., we will have Air Elite online with us talking about flying a uh, turbo Seneca. So hopefully you all can join. Um, I had one other thing I was going to mention. Um, please, if you um, if you want any of these decks, definitely go to the website. I'll upload those to the, the resources area of our website. Um, so you can download all of that. And you can also download the, the resources from last night from the SFRA refresher. So if you want the knee board that was updated, definitely download that from there. Um, but again, thank you all for joining. Um, I know that the Zoom fatigue is, is real, so I appreciate you taking all the time. Thank you to our three presenters. Um, I'm gonna go have a smokehouse cookie. <laughs> you guys have a good night. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Nice, nice to meet you, Tracy. Yes. Hey, you too, Mike. Give me a shout if you end up back here in Hill, Hillsboro. I, I'm looking forward to when they let us travel again. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great night. Thank you. See ya. <laughs>